Okay. So if you could just first just spell your name for me. Uh, it's G R E G H O W A R D. And how did you first get acquainted with Dave Matthews? I, think I first met him uh, when he was working at Miller's, uh, or actually, it's possible that I met him before that. Exactly when things happened when, I don't really know, but uh, I remember the first time I ever saw him performing uh, was with Tim's band, TR3, at the CNO Club. He was uh, singing with them, and uh, I was their sound man. So uh, Tim comes up to me and says, oh, we're going to have this guy sing with us. And, you know, can you set up an extra microphone? And I didn't know, you know, what was going on. So uh, he sang, I think the song he sang was Exodus. And uh, uh, it, was, it was pretty interesting. What did you think of his voice back then? Well, I liked it. I mean, uh, I started to listen to him more uh, doing other things, solo things, and other kinds of performances uh, after that. But uh, uh, it certainly was very different than it is now. It was, um, it was a lot softer. And uh, I'd say that he... Um, He's a more more confident in his inflections now than he was back then. I think you know he was he was just getting started, so he really didn't didn't have a handle on his voice yet. So for someone who doesn't know, could you just set up who TR3 is? Well, TR3 was Tim Reynolds' band, and um, at that time it was Tim on guitar and vocals, uh, Robert Jospe on drums, and a guy named Warren Richardson on bass and vocals. And they played all around the, the club scene in Charlottesville and Harrisonburg and Richmond. And uh, the band kind of evolved a little bit. Uh, a guy named Charlie Kilpatrick ended up playing keyboards with them. Um, Johnny Gilmore played drums with them for a while. Uh, and I did sound for them. That's how I got hooked up with all of these guys. How did Dave and Tim meet? I think they probably met down at Miller's because Tim was playing down there every Monday night and uh, Dave was working there as a bartender. So I'm pretty sure that's how they met. And what was their relationship like? Oh, gosh. Um, I don't really know um, for sure. I mean, it was I didn't know that Dave was a musician. Like, I knew he worked at Miller's, but I didn't know he was a singer until I saw him on stage, at, you know, until he got up on stage at the CNO and sang that song that night. Were you surprised, you know, he was with his bartender at Miller's that yeah, because I played at Miller's and I didn't really know him. I mean, I recognized his face. Um, but, you know, when Tim told me that Dave uh, was going to sing with the band, I was like, I couldn't place who he was talking about. I had no idea. Um, so for somebody who doesn't know, can you set up what, like, what was Charlottesville like back then? What was going on? What was the scene like? Well, the music scene was really multidimensional. There were so many different musicians um, who were coming at it from different directions. There were a lot of local players, uh, people like Leroy Moore and Carter Beaufort and Johnny Gilmore, Houston Ross. And then uh, there, were, uh, there was a jazz influx from New York, um, Robert Jospe, uh, who was a drummer, uh, but mainly uh, John Durth, the trumpet player, and Don Thompson as a vocalist. Uh, the three of them came down to Charlottesville in the late 80s and started working with this band uh, that they had already called Cosmology. And um, they had come down here to just kind of escape New York uh, temporarily and ended up staying and living here. And they started to uh, do a lot of improv performances and things and get people from the local scene to come out and play with them. And so uh, while uh, Leroy and Carter had worked together in the past. Um, they all kind of started to get connected through um, what John and Dawn were doing and also through just different other combinations. It was, it was pretty incestuous, actually. Everybody played with everybody else, and there were all these different bands made up of the same group of people, but the music of each band was really different from all the other bands. So there was Cosmology. And then there was a band called The Basics, which uh, started out with Carter and uh, Carter on drums and Leroy on saxophone and Houston Ross on the bass. And then I think when Carter moved to Richmond, Johnny started playing drums with them. And I did a bunch of shows with them on sax also. And uh, Tim played some guitar every now and then with the band. And I think even Peter Greiser, uh, who played keyboards with uh, Dave later on, also played some with The Basics. It was just a a funk jam band and a lot of fun. Um, so that was really where I started to do things with Leroy. And then um, we had another group called Code Magenta that was Leroy on sax and Don Thompson on vocals and me on the stick. And that was an improv music and poetry group. And then there was that fusion group, Cosmology. 
And then there was also a band in Richmond called Secrets that John was in with Carter and Butch Taylor, who's now keyboard player in the Dave Matthews Band, and another keyboard player named Dane Bryant, and a really great bass player named Keith Horn. So uh, it was just this connection, this constant connection and reconnection and reshuffling of people. Um, and uh, it was a small town, but there was an awful lot of music going on. It's so rare. You know? I, I don't know. This is the place I know, so you know it's it's hard for me to say. It's changed a lot, though. I mean, that scene really doesn't exist anymore, uh, in large part because when these guys started to get as popular as they did, they were removed from the scene. So we didn't have them as a resource. How often did they play with T.R. Green? You know, he only sang with them a couple of times uh, that I remember. Um, he did that, and then he also did a uh, guest vocal spot on this modern dance piece that John Durth had written the score for. Uh, it was called Bypass, and it was the Mickey List Dance Company. Uh, and again, it was like, you know, the same people, you know, were there. Uh, I can't remember exactly who was in the band for it, but um, I did sound for the production, and Tim and I did uh, entry music for it. Uh, when people were coming in, and uh, Dawn sang a lot of songs, and they picked Dave to sing this one song that was just a really great um, kind of a Latin jazzy tune called Meaningful Love, and uh, he, he brought the house down. Was, um, was this a big, what, what, like, what was the basis behind Bypass? Bypass was a piece, a dance piece, that Mickey List had uh, gotten a commission from the National Endowment for the Arts for, and she commissioned John to write the score for it, and John and Dawn wrote the music and the lyrics for it. So it was all original music, and so it was a modern dance piece, and, um, but instead of using just instrumental music, uh, it was based uh, a lot on these songs. So there was an interaction between the dance and the songs, and it was... Uh, kind of an automotive theme, you know, bypass being like, you know, automo automotive bypass. And it was a really interesting show. It got a, it got a great response. Is this Dave's first paying gig, I think? I think it was probably his, his first big exposure gig, uh, the, at least the first one that I remember. Uh, that would have been in the late summer or early fall, probably September of 1989. What was the audience reaction to that? Well, they loved the piece. Um, I think we performed it three or four times, and uh, each time the whole, the whole performance got better. But uh, as I said, uh, he really brought down the house. He really, uh, he really went over big on people. The whole thing did, but I remember people really had a strong reaction to him. He must have been like 22 at the time. I don't remember. But he had, he had really long hair, and he was really skinny. And, uh, but he just had this presence on the stage that people really gravitated to. Um, it's interesting because, you know, obviously he doesn't look like now like he did back then, but, you know, he, what, like, what would he, what was his, obviously, you know, he just moved from South Africa, and so he's living in Charlottesville, like, was it obvious that the South, it had South African roots, like, was it apparent? I don't think so. Uh, I certainly didn't notice that. I mean, maybe a little in his speech, but I think that, um, uh, I would say it's more of a kind of a British pop influence in his persona. I know that um, like Peter Gabriel was a big inspiration for him. Uh, and I remember uh, when I first started to see him performing solo, uh, when we first started to record his demo tunes, uh, it was very much Dave though. It really didn't sound like anybody else. And I didn't really pick up that South African influence uh, at that point uh, in terms of what he was doing. So he did a couple gigs with TR3. What happened next? Well, the, the bypass thing came after that. And then uh, I'm not really sure exactly what started happening when, but um, we had a series of uh, coffee house performances at this place called Live Arts, which um, was a community theater that was just opening then. I think their first production was in 89 also. And um, the coffee house was kind of like a live, Saturday Night Live-ish kind of skit thing. And so there were all these brief little skits and music performances. And Dave was acting in them, but he was also singing. He would play guitar and sing. And uh, we did a couple of performances together. I remember uh, playing sax with him uh, on one of them. And uh, he really worked well in that intimate setting, I mean, where people could really make a connection with him. I think. Um, it, it kind of foreshadows his development uh, as an artist, as a musician, 
that he w is able was able to make this connection at that time and really get people's attention. And uh, again, you know, he was uh, he was a, a smash success. People really liked him. And so then, what happened after that? How did what were the steps up to the point where he's like, let's make a demo? Or what happened? He had been. Um, uh, I'm not really sure exactly what happened. Uh, in you know, after that point, I saw him in doing these coffee houses. I saw him when I would play at Miller's, and he'd be bartending. I'd see him there, and um, a friend of ours. Uh, a guy named Ross Hoffman, who was also a friend of John and Don's, um, had gotten involved in Dave's work and really wanted to uh, push him. And so uh, Ross uh, knew that I had a studio set up and he had been a, a fan of my work for a while. And he brought Dave over to my house to do a demo because he just he liked the way I put things together. And uh, so we did a four song demo. And um, it was a lot of fun. John was involved in it, and a percussionist named Kevin Davis. And uh, but it was Dave's, I guess, really his first four completed songs. And he was even finishing them, you know, while we were working on the demo. I remember him uh, on the song "The Best of What's Around." He was, you know, really trying to get the lyrics together because we we had a, sort of a self-imposed deadline to take this demo up to New York and play it for some people. And so he was really trying to get that song finished. And uh, I remember him just kind of looking around the room to try and find little glimpses of things that he could insert. And uh, the band that Tim and I had was called Sticks and Stones. And there's a line in the first version of that song, The Best of What's Around, where he says, uh, stick and stone and something else. And then uh, it didn't end up in the final version. So I just thought that was pretty funny that, uh, that he was picking things out of the environment to, to pull the lyrics together. Is that what his process was normally like? Somewhere? I'm not really sure. I think mostly he started out with guitar riffs. And uh, his guitar playing is so strong and his ideas are so original that I think they really propel the song. And so uh, I remember when we were working on Before These Crowded Streets later on, all of those songs, the music was written first, um, and the lyrical ideas, I guess with the exception of Halloween, that is, because they had performed that before. But um, the lyrical ideas came afterwards, and I think that that's what he did a lot of early on. I think that's one of the reasons why his songs are so musical, too. Uh, the Beatles work the same way, you know, work on the music first and, uh, you know, see where it takes you. Of course, I, I could be wrong about that. I'm sure there are songs that he wrote uh, with the lyric concept first, but I'd be surprised if it was, you know, very many. Does Dave write the music too? Oh, yeah. He wrote all the music for those songs. He wrote the lyrics and um, the melodies. Uh, one of the things that's really astounding about him, and when you don't get a sense of that when you're listening to the band as much, but if you try to juxtapose his vocal with his guitar part, it's really complicated rhythmically a lot of the times what he's doing. And I could never figure out how he could make that, you know, connection, that process, and, and really do those two things at once. It, it, it's hard to do because the lines are really original parts, very unusual guitar playing. Yeah, definitely. And he had the style even back then? Oh, absolutely. I mean, when you listen to his early demo, uh, you hear uh, his guitar playing is really, you know, strongly formalized in that. Uh, the, a lot of the, you know, very angular kind of jumping parts within the lines, uh, switching back to some really strong rhythmic strumming things. Um, his first song, the song that Jane likes, I think that was the first song that he wrote, um, was very, uh, it's a great example of his style of writing. Uh, it's very dynamic, a lot of energy, pauses, uh, great flow really jumping all over the place in the lyrics. Um, it was just a really, it was really a clue into what he was going to end up doing later on. And so this demo, what songs were featured on the demo? There were four songs. Um, uh, the song that Jane likes, the, uh, let's see, the second one was I'll Back You Up, which is a great, you know, ballad. Uh, I think we were probably a little heavy handed on the production on that. Uh, if you get a chance to hear it, I'll let you be the judge. Uh, and then a song called Recently, which is a great tune. Um, and, uh, and then uh, The Best of What's Around. And The Best of What's Around is a solo number, but all the rest of them have other production elements on them. Like the song that Jane likes was with a percussionist named Kevin Davis. Um, and I played stick on it. I played a bass part on the stick and did backing vocals which uh, was, was pretty fun, something I, I don't do. I don't sing anymore, so I, it was a kick to listen to this the other day and, and hear myself singing along with him. 
And let's see, on recently it was uh, guitar and vocal, and then I uh, played sax, and John played trumpet. And John has this really incredible ability to arrange these horn lines. And uh, so we were playing these harmonies, uh, st uh, saxophone and trumpet harmonies, along with um, the guitar part, and I played the bass part on the stick. But the most fun about it was um, that I actually played all the percussion on a keyboard. It was all samples played along with his guitar part uh, while he was while he was tracking it. So there's a real connection. It doesn't sound like you know, you're listening to sampled percussion. There's a real connection there. That's so cool. Yeah. What was the purpose of the demo? Uh, Ross wanted to get Dave's songs into the ears of people who would appreciate him and you know and and take an interest in him. Um, Ross was very interested in Dave's, uh, you know, developing him as an artist. Uh, he, he, Ross was also very involved with Hanson and, and getting them signed to their deal. So he, he had a certain kind of a flair for things. And uh, I think that he was also really interested in pushing the writing process for Dave. Um, although I don't really know that much about their dynamic, I saw them working together a few times. and. Uh, and they were obviously Dave's songs, but uh, Ross was his, his cheerleader, really. He was pushing him into it. Or not, we, I shouldn't say he was pushing him into it. I should say he was encouraging him and giving him feedback. And um, so uh, he knew when he heard Dave, like so many other people back then, uh, that he was really hearing something special and uh, wanted to, to take it somewhere. So what was the next process? I mean, you guys made this demo. When did he start forming? We made the demo, and then uh, we brought it up to New York. And I remember um, thinking that I was going to be involved with Dave, like that there would be this maybe a trio ensemble, you know, per percussion, stick, and guitar. But uh, right around uh, Christmas time of that year, I think uh, Leroy approached Dave about wanting to play with him. And I know that Dave had wanted to get a band together, and so uh, he wanted a conventional bass, and uh, so Stefan uh, ended up getting that job. And you know, to have the option of Carter as your drummer is something that uh, I think there are a million musicians out there who would love to have that option. So they started out as a quartet, and uh, it was it was pretty interesting. Did they play a lot around town? They played a lot of um, small gigs. Uh, their first show was at uh, this woman named Lydia Condor's house uh, and then the pink warehouse on the rooftop. It was a party. And uh, I remember hearing them and thinking that uh, I wasn't really that into their interpretations of the songs because I had I heard them myself. You know, I'd heard the ones that we came up with in the demo process. And it took me a long time to get used to the band's sound. In the beginning, I mean, was, did they have troubles, you know, getting together and finding their niche? I, I don't think so. I think that, um, you know, they, they were all pretty shy people in a way, so I think probably the biggest difficulty they would have had is to try to get themselves out there. Um, but I think they really loved playing the music, and uh, it really showed you know, that they were into it. And it worked really well for all of them, uh, and especially for Stefan, because, you know, here's a very young bass player who has really never worked with another drummer, you know, and to get to play with one of the, arguably one of the best drummers in the world, you know, from the beginning of your musical career, um, it's, a, it's a real privilege for him, I think, and he brought a lot to the table, though, too. How many people were at the, um, at the Pink Warehouse party? Oh, I, if you could find anybody who could actually remember how many people were at that party, I'd be astounded, but... Uh, I'd say, you know, somewhere between 30 and 50 people, probably. And was everybody really watching the band, or it wasn't a big deal? Or? I think people really were checking out the band. Uh, I think that um, it was a party. You know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a concert. It wasn't a performance. Um, so there, were other, there was other music happening that night, too, I think. But uh, Ross lived in that building, and uh, Lydia was a friend of everybody's. And it was a cool space. It was a, it's a really, it was a really neat space. So I remember taking the demo over to Lydia's and playing it for her right after we had finished it. She was like, wow, that's really good. <laughs> so then what happens next? Were you at the, um, the Tandem Mother's Day? Uh, I was at the Tandem Mother's Day show, um, but not with, um, let's see. Can you say that again? I was at the Tandem Mother's Day show, but I was there playing with Cosmology 
uh, with John and Leroy, and Carter was playing drums, and Dawn and on uh, vocals, and Tim Reynolds was playing guitar, and Leroy was sitting in with us too, and uh, I think David sang something with us, but I don't remember. So that was a cosmology show, so I was there for that. And uh, to be honest, I don't remember seeing Dave there um, or at the, or the Earth Day show that they did, which so many people talk about. I guess because I, um, I was doing a lot of stuff on my own too, but uh, I experienced them more more at um, tracks and at Miller's. And I know they played a lot of, started playing a lot of fraternity parties too. So um, just time frame wise, when did, you know, Leroy and Carter and Stefan all get involved with Dave? That would have been in early 91. So the demo was done in October of 90, and then the band started doing things in early 91. And we did a couple more demo sessions after that. Um, like in 91, we did one. And Dave continued to go and do solo demo projects with people. I know he went up to New York a couple of times and, and you know just recorded a bunch of songs. And uh, it's really interesting to hear him just play these songs as a solo guitar player and then to hear the band's interpretation of the songs. They're pretty radically different from each other and they're both great. When did Boyd get involved? Or what's, do you give me a little background on Boyd too? Well, funny enough, I met Boyd when we were both UVA students at the same time and uh, I remember sitting in a dorm room uh, over when we were first year students and I'm sitting in the study lounge at, at the Tuttle dorm and I hear this guy playing the violin. And uh, so I went upstairs and I, you know, knocked on his door and, uh, and met Boyd down there. And uh, that was pretty amusing, you know, years later, uh, you know, to see this happening for him. But uh, he was playing a lot with his own band. Uh, I think they were called Down Boy Down. And um, later on, I think, um, I think I should know this, um, there was a band called the Boyd Tinsley Band which uh, had Boyd and uh, I think Harry Faulkner was in that band. Uh, Down Boy Down was just a duo with him uh, and a guitar player whom I can't remember at this point. I think it was Larry Becker. But um, So Boyd started, um, I think he, his band opened up for them one night, if I remember correctly, and he guessed, uh, he guested with them. And I think uh, shortly after that, he started playing with them pretty regularly. Um, and I think this was, this, yeah, this was after Peter had been playing with the band. So uh, Peter was really the first regular addition to the band. And it wasn't after he was playing with them for a while that Boyd started playing. So they ended up with six people on stage, plus guests. Tim would go down and play with them. There was this other sax player named Richard Hardy who would sit in with them a lot. Um, this percussionist, Miguel of uh, Valdez, used to um, sit in with them too. And he was playing with TR3. And so it was all interconnected still, even at that point, even when they were doing the track shows and the Flood Zone shows. So early on, did they have a lot of songs in their repertoire, or? They didn't have a lot of songs. Um, and, uh, you know, I think Dave tried to kind of get them out as quickly as he could. Um, Peter started writing some things for him, too. There were a couple of songs like um, So Much to Say, and um, he wrote a song with Dave called People, People that they did. And they did some covers too. Um, Watchtower became a big part of their repertoire early on, but uh, uh, I think they got that from Tim because TR3 used to do that song. Um, so, um, and then they did uh, Daniel and Wah tune called uh, Blue Water, I think. And uh, threw different things in uh, periodically. Um, it seems like Tim was definitely a big influence on Dave. Absolutely. Yeah, huge influence. I, I don't think you could underestimate that influence. And their, their partnership is a, really, uh, is a really great one because uh, they're completely different musicians. I mean, I could say that Tim is a big influence on Dave, but I would say he's more of an influence uh, conceptually and uh, you know, as, a, as a partner than as somebody who uh, taught Dave how to do anything in a particular way. I think they just fit together really well early on. You were talking earlier about Dave and acting. Um, how was Dave as an actor? He was really engaging. Uh, I remember the first time I saw him as an actor uh, was in a play uh, that was part of the Bar Hoppers series that they did. Uh, this company called Offstage Theater had a series called Bar Hoppers, and they would do the plays in the bars downtown. Um, they would do it at Miller's, and they'd do it at... Um, 
Eastern Standard, which was Mark Roebuck was working down there as a bartender. So uh, again, it was a small scene and everybody was very connected. And I remember this play that Dave did with Margaret Baldwin that was very uh, lascivious and uh, high energy, a lot of, um, a lot of action on the bar. <laughs> and uh, it was very entertaining and uh, very fun. He's a very strong comedic actor, but uh, I think that uh, he has the potential to be really an incredible dramatic actor too. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised to see him in a whole bunch of films in the next few years. Did, do you remember um, was it Just Say No and you used car salesmen to that play? Just Say No, yeah, it was a, um, uh, gosh, that was a play that uh, they did with, I guess it was Sarah, the Sexual Assault Resource Agency, oh, promoted no, yeah, that. Oh, I think it's But I Said No. There's oh, But I Said No. Yeah, there's one that's, I think, about... That's the one that rape. Margaret wrote about date rape, and yeah. And there's one that he's used yeah, I don't remember the used car salesman one, um, and to be honest, I don't remember the but I said no. Um, but some of the pieces that he did for the coffee houses were very uh, dramatic. Uh, some of them were purely comedic. Um, John Quinn wrote some really interesting uh, sketches uh, that we did, and I acted with him a couple of times, but uh, uh, we actually started a production of No, was it? No, sorry. We actually started a production of Waiting for Godot that um, uh, John Quinn was in, and I was in, and Dave was in, and uh, it was we never performed it, which is too bad. We were rehearsing it one summer, and we never got around to playing it. But uh, uh, he's a great actor. Was there a big theater scene in Charleston? There was. Uh, you had offstage theater, uh, and you had the live arts theater ensemble, which was doing a lot of really interesting plays. Uh, the first one we did there was was No Exit, and I did the music for that. That was the first production at Live Arts. And then they had all the coffee houses as well. And, um, you know, it's an, it's an amateur theater scene, but some really interesting things, some great writing. Um, Fran Sackett, uh, who's now Fran Smith, um, she and Margaret Baldwin were very active with this kids program um, called Kids Only that worked there. It was a summer theater uh, program that Live Arts did. And uh, it was just a, a piece of the art scene in downtown Charlottesville, which uh, I'm sure you've seen other scenes in other places where you've got an, an old downtown area that's not really booming, you know, commercially. It's certainly nothing at all like it is now. And uh, so the people who were interested in working on these things congregated in just a few places. And... You know, Miller's was one of those places. Um, the CNO was one of those places. Eastern Standard was one of those places. Well, for somebody, you know, paint me a picture. What was like the average night like in Charlottesville? Well, it was it was quiet. Um, it, outside, it was quiet. Inside, there was always something going on. You know, uh, let's see. Back in those days, everybody smoked everywhere, and there was a you know a, a lot of drinking going on. All of us were in our twenties. So it was very much of a kind of a constant party atmosphere, and there was something happening just about every place. And it was always very entertaining and creative, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, John playing down at Miller's uh, with his group or um, something happening at Live Arts. Uh, you know, uh, Peter Greiser lived in a house not too far from downtown and not too far from Dave's house, where his, you know, where his mom lived. And so you could, you could, generally stumble down to Peter's house periodically and there'd be something going on there and just a lot of characters and uh, a lot of young creative adults uh, you know out and about nighttime was was really the time when things were happening when did Dave's oh, sorry yeah, okay. um, so where were we oh so when you first met Dave was he taking classes at uh, Piedmont Community College or no yeah, I think it, this might have been after that because I think that, um, or he may have been doing it during that time. I don't really know. Um, I think to say that David and I were friends really isn't accurate. I mean, we, we saw each other and we worked with each other, but uh, I didn't really know that much about his life outside of the situations where I was working with him. It seems like a lot of people were like that. It was just like he was constantly using his energy to like try different projects and try different things. That, cause I, I, you know, I'll ask him, like, well, what did you guys do? And he's like, all we did was sit around and think of ideas or make plays or... Do you know what I mean? There wasn't, that was life on a daily basis, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting because uh, I think uh, to give you an accurate picture of it, I mean, there were so many late nights hanging out after hours at Miller's, you know, people just hanging out upstairs, drinking, talking, you know, the hang was king in Charlottesville. And you could see everybody. I mean, I couldn't believe how many people would be in that place after hours. I mean, you can see it from the street. You walk down the street at 4 o'clock in the morning, there was a party going on you know, downstairs at Miller's, and, uh, you know, the police would walk by, and just like, hey, how's it going? <laughs> Every now and then they'd come in and say, you know, you're all supposed to be closed, so we'd go upstairs. <laughs> so at this point, when was Dave doing acting first, or where did the acting fall in? Um, I think it all kind of fell in um, at the same time. I think his first forays into performance were in music, and then uh, he started doing acting as well. And uh, he's also a really interesting visual artist. Um, in fact, he did the, the, the drawing logo for a poster for the next Mickey Lewis Dance Company uh, production, which was called Touch, which I ended up writing the music for. So uh, he was very multidimensional um, in pursuing all those different things. Yeah, Mark Roebuck told us that he would have these journals, and it would just be like, patches of writing and the drawing and just mm -hmm. everything intertwined with each other. Yeah, and I think he really lived to create. I think that was his, uh, his, his real purpose in doing the things that he did, to create and to socialize. Dave was an incredibly social person. And I think that that's part of why uh, the band works the way that it does uh, and part of why um, you know, he was able to hook up with those people and to sustain this you know, for so long. I mean, they've been at it for 12 years. That's a long time. <laughs> and I think they've been out every summer for like the last 10 years on tour, which is just amazing. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So the, the social connection was a really huge part of, of Dave's um, activity. Uh, and uh, he sought people out. People sought him out. Uh, he was very entertaining, very gregarious, very engaging and uh, always on, it seemed. I don't think he really saw David in unguarded moments very often. I think he was, he was up and on and very out there. And uh, it was uh, a much, kind of a much more pleasant Jim Carrey, if you will, you know, just very uh, humorous and engaging. And um, so I think the acting was in him all the time. I mean, I think that uh, it's part of who he is, especially when he's on stage, but also part of who he is when he's not on stage. Where was he living when you first met him? He was living with his mom um, um, in that house downtown off of, um, I guess it's 2nd Street. I can't remember exactly. And did you guys ever practice a lot in his basement there? Or no? Well, they did. I wasn't actually in the band. So the work that we did together, we did at my studio. Um, and um, so they, I think they rehearsed there. Uh, mostly in the basement, and he, I guess he pretty much lived in the basement of that house. It wasn't a big house. And Peter was there, his brother, and uh, Jane, and uh, their mom. Could you say that again, I stepped over you. Oh, sorry. And uh, his brother Peter was there, and Jane and his mom were all living there. Was his family around a lot? Were they part of the scene too, or...? Well, the scene was part of them, I think. Um, a, lot of, a lot of hanging around was done at their house. And uh, uh, Val is really uh, a very amazing person. And uh, she, she knew everybody, and she was always happy to see people hanging out in her house. And you could tell that there was a lot of love in the family that, um, and that they interacted with each other a lot. I mean, Jane was very much involved with the scene, uh, although she was very low-key. She was always there but uh, she wasn't involved as a performer. Was the family very supportive of him in doing this musical? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Uh, I think they all, they all saw what everybody else saw, um, which was a very talented person um, without uh, a pretentious personality. You know, and, and I think that that's something that a lot of people really warm up to. If you can, uh, if you can see somebody who's really creative uh, creating, and they don't do it in such a way that's alienating, then uh, that's really something worth supporting. Yeah, definitely. Did, did you guys back then, did people know, like, he'll be going somewhere? Like, was there that feeling? Or? I still haven't realized how hugely successful they are. I mean, to me, um, 
to have people that you know be that successful is really uh, unreal. And I think that uh, part of why it's unreal is that they really don't act like rock stars as people, you know. They're just as glad to see you now as they were 10 years ago. And, um, you know, we don't see each other all that often because I'm touring and they're touring. And uh, it's nice when we do cross paths. But uh, when we do, you know, it's just like you're the same person you ever were and so are they. We discussed um, Roy's background, but what is, you know, what, where's, what's Leroy's background? Well, Leroy's from Charlottesville. Um, he grew up uh, out west of town, um, and his dad was a coach at the high school, and um, he was a driving instructor also, I think. I seem to remember that. And um, so Leroy was playing music back in high school, and he and Carter jammed together a lot. And um, so back in, I guess, you know, marching band or high school band or whatever, I'm not really sure exactly. But uh, Leroy went away to school. He was in Philadelphia for a while, I think. Uh, he doesn't really talk about his, his days away from Charlottesville all that much. But I remember seeing him uh, really actively on the music scene back in the late 80s, uh, especially when I came uh, back to town from New Mexico in 89. He was really involved in things. And so we were doing shows as the basics. and. Uh, uh, he was doing a lot of shows down at Miller's. He would play with John. He played in the Charlottesville Swing Orchestra, which is a group that uh, John Durth and Don Thompson have. And uh, so he was doing all kinds of things. Leroy was playing jazz. He was playing swing. He was playing funk. He was playing um, fusion. Uh, and really brilliantly, uh, if anything, I'd say that... Um, the direction of the band is, is a different direction than the direction that he would have seen himself pursuing if he was to step back and say, this is the kind of music I want to make. But at the same time, he was really into a lot of um, like the African pop bands. I remember we were doing openings at tracks uh, as the basics. We would open up for people like Johnny Clegg and the Bundu Boys, and um, that was where I really saw this connection between what was going on with those guys and what was going on with these other bands, these West African pop bands, because a lot of them came to town, and, and Yusu Endure played at tracks. I mean, it was, it was amazing, and the Basics were always the band that opened up for those kinds of bands when they came to town, which was a lot of fun. We had a blast. Do you, what do you think some of the band's influences are? In terms of the Dave Matthews band? Yeah. Well, I think that um, they are not really influenced as a band by other bands. I would say that each one of the musicians has their own influences uh, that they bring to the table because they're all so different from each other. I mean, Carter is an amazing drummer, and he has uh, Dennis Chambers in his music, and he has uh, Omar Hakim in his music. He has a lot of uh, different influences, but he also has uh, influences that are not um, drum-oriented influences, you know, um, uh, R&B, uh, fusion influences, a lot of uh, jazz, you know, Miles, Coltrane, Elvin Jones has definitely got to be an influence with Carter. Uh, but Carter has his own thing. I mean, he's taken those influences and turned them into a way of drumming that was his before the band ever even got going. I mean, there's an interplay between Carter and David that is really unique, and it's, it's the heart of that band. You know, you take away Carter and put another drummer in there, and it's not the same band. So I'd say that, um, I'd say that each of them influences the band as an individual, rather than the band having influences come in from the outside and influence what they do. The songs, Oh, I teach, like, all day long stick seminars, so I can talk for hours. Oh, uh, yeah. You're lucky you don't have hours. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing a great job. Okay. So what are some of Dave's influences, do you think? David is definitely influenced by Peter Gabriel, um, definitely influenced by the Beatles, uh, definitely influenced by The Police and Sting, and definitely influenced by Daniel Lenoir. Um, but it's funny to see other influences come out. Um, 
you know, I would say Bob Dylan has to be an influence on him, but I wouldn't have seen that early on. Um, I remember uh, when Dave did a solo show down in Richmond at the Flood Zone opening up for Daniel Lenoir, who was playing there. It was one of the only times I've ever seen Dave really nervous because here's this guy who's like, you know, somebody he really honors and respects, and he's opening up for him. And I think he was just sick as a dog, too. And so he really gave it all he had to try to make a big impression on him. But uh, that's, that was unlike David. It's not really characteristic of him. Did he do a lot of um, solo shows? He did. Uh, a few solo shows. Uh, and uh, he would play at Miller's every now and then. Uh, we did a couple of duet shows together, which was really fun. Um, but mostly he played with the band. And that was really where his heart was. And I think that um, he felt the power of those guys. He didn't need them to prop him up. I mean, he was a great performer in his own right. But I think he really reveled in uh, the power that he got from those guys and uh, the interaction that he had with them. What was Dave's role in the group? Well, you don't really hear it when you listen to their records or you listen to the live shows. But the, the core of all of their songs is the guitar part that Dave is playing. And it's very creative, very rhythmic, uh, very driving part. No matter what song you're talking about, you can listen to it, and that's what the tune is, is based around. That's what the song is based around. And, you know, uh, Carter has his, his own relationship to that, but at the core of the songs is Dave's guitar playing. So he brings the, the musical idea, the, the core of the song, he brings... And also, you know, as a singer, he brings, you know, the, the message of the song and um, the vibe of the song with him. It definitely seems like um, there's a struggle where, you know, fans or just because he is the front man is trying to make him the front man in his band. But he, it, it's a struggle within him that he doesn't want that. Like, he wants to be a member of the band. Can you talk about that? He's really into being in the band, and um, in a way it's ironic that the band is called the Dave Matthews Band because I think that that's not really where his heart is in terms of how he relates to the other musicians. And uh, I've never talked to them about it. I don't know how they feel about it either. Uh, I think it happened because they had to come up with a name for the band for a gig that they had. And so that's what they ended up with, and that's what ended up uh, staying with them. But uh, I think that he doesn't really uh, want to be thrust out above the band. And you can tell that by watching him on stage. You know, there's, there's a great deal of deference and attention that, that travels around the band from player to player. And uh, he doesn't seem to like to have his voice um, too far out front, although it is, you know, it's the core of the song. But his guitar, I always felt like his guitar is, is underplayed in the music. And uh, in fact, when I was doing some shows with them as a guest artist uh, out in California back in 98, uh, I would go out to the front of the house where the sound mixer was, and I always gave Bagby a hard time because I said, you know, Bagby, you can't hear the guitar, man. You've got to turn the guitar up. That's the song. That's what's in there. Because I knew that from the demos, you know, what Dave was doing. And uh, I couldn't hear it w well enough for my own taste. So. Um, I think he got tired of that, though. <laughs> Definitely. That's so funny. Um, so just when did Peter um, enter the band? Like, when did he become part of it? Peter, no, oh, sorry. Peter Greiser worked as a bartender down at Miller's. And uh, he and Dave were friends, and they were neighbors. They lived really close to each other. And I think he just started sitting in with them at first, and um, they wanted a bigger sound. Uh, I imagine, you know, with only four pieces, an acoustic guitar, uh, electric bass, saxophone, and drums, there's kind of a sonic hole in there, you know, unless you present the guitar in a certain way. And I think that's not what they wanted to do. They didn't want to use an electric guitar. And so to be able to expand the orchestration and uh, have a little bit more sonic presence, uh, you know, you add a keyboard player. And Peter also played harmonica, too. Uh, and he sang, and so there was all these different elements that he brought in to the band. And uh, he really filled out the sound in a lot of ways, um, which was a, a good thing. Uh, I had actually played keyboards with them uh, in a rehearsal at my house one time, 
just to kind of see how things would fit. This was very early on in the band, and um, I don't know if I ever could have been the keyboard player in the Dave Matthews band. I think that I really probably wasn't good enough, but uh, my heart wasn't in it. My heart was in playing the stick, so it was never even something that I really seriously concern, considered doing. When, so when did Peter I think it was in 92. Uh, in early 92, Peter started playing with them. Because uh, I remember um, we did one demo session at my studio in 92 where Peter came in and played some keyboards on it. Um, but they had been playing pretty regularly at tracks and at the Flood Zone by that point and uh, had been going out and doing, you know, frat shows and things. So he was going on the road with the band. And then why did Peter end up leaving? Oh, uh, you'd have. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think um, I think Peter probably got tired of the road. Uh, I think uh, back in those days it was pretty hard. You know, they weren't making a ton of money. Uh, they had long drives uh, to do shows. Uh, crazy things happen when you're on the road. Uh, I think one time they cracked a windshield on their van by trying to use a a beer can as an as a frost scraper or something like that. I mean. Just weird stuff happen when you're on the road. And I think that uh, uh, either he didn't want to hang out until things got to the point where they could be, or uh, it was too much was happening. Because Boyd had started playing with them before Peter left the band. So there was already a lot happening on the stage. And maybe it just didn't work out musically. Maybe it was just too much happening. Can we uh, change? Come on in. Okay, so yeah, go on with what you were just talking about. Um, the band was really popular, uh, but I think that early on the fans were not just interested in the music. There was a social scene that surrounded them that was really uh, unbelievable. Uh, they played every Tuesday and every when every Tuesday at tracks, and it, so let me start that over. They played every Tuesday night at tracks and every Wednesday night at the Flood Zone in Richmond, and. Uh, Early on, the girls were the ones who went to see them. Like, Dave really had, you know, he's got pretty strong charisma and sex appeal, and, uh, you know, I think uh, Carter does too, although uh, I don't know if he'd, he'd want me to say that. Carter definitely uh, was always very uh, engaging, and people really liked him a lot. So uh, the girls started to go see them play, and the guys figured this out, and so they started to go down there and hang out too. So it was a big, uh, for lack of a better term, it was a big meat market down at Tracks every Tuesday night. It was huge throngs of people. And some of the songs that Dave would try to play, you know, really quiet tunes, if you listen to recordings of those shows, you can't even hear him because there's so much talking. And uh, I'm not trying to say that people didn't love the music and that they don't love it now, but there was this party atmosphere and social aspect to their success that I don't think you can underestimate. And I think you see that at their shows today. You see the same kind of folks going to their shows now as we're going to those shows back then. And it's a great time. It's happy music. And you have to look at it in, in context that that was like immediately post Nirvana, post grunge, and people didn't necessarily want to hear that music. They wanted to hear something that was up and positive and acoustic and um, just not heavy and not hard and not a downer. And so they came along at the right time, I think. Uh, they, really, they really caught people's attention because they were a different sounding band. They were a very social kind of a band, very happy band, and people, people really responded to that. What about, like, you have all these different players. You have, you know, Carter and Leroy and, and Boyd, and they have all such different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You know, like, Boyd's trained classically, and, like, none of them had ever been in a rock-type band at all. So why were they, why do you think they were willing to, like, give up these other side projects and other things going on and focus on this band with Dave Matthews? What was it, why were they so willing? I think every musician uh, has... Uh, things that resonate with them. And one of the things that really resonates uh, if you've been performing in groups is good material. Uh, the songs that Dave wrote and that those guys adapted and made into their own songs um, were great songs. And they had uh, tremendous power because of that for them as musicians. 
I mean, you can work uh, night after night after night in bands that you really like, but you can tell doing it that, you know, you're never going to become a huge smash success. You do it because you love it. And I think that all of those guys had to see the potential in the material, you know, because all that music that you hear on the radio, that's coming from somewhere. Why couldn't it be coming from you? Uh, and when Dave brings those songs to the table and these guys each bring their own special talents into the mix, uh, they recognized that it was a great combination. Uh, the band was already a phenomenon before Boyd started to work with them. So I think he saw it as a really great opportunity uh, and it worked out great for them because he's got this fantastic stage presence, which um, nothing against their musical abilities, but you know, before Boyd started playing with them, they were a little less high energy than they are now. And he brought that spark, he brought that visual element to what they were doing. And uh, you know, he's, he's uh, conscious of his appearance and he's conscious of his role. He's a spark on stage. I mean, when he starts ripping into a solo, the crowd goes crazy. Um, you were mentioning earlier Dave's lyrics. Where do you think that Dave gets his ideas for songs from? Uh, the songs that I'm most familiar with uh, and the songs that I think really resonate the most with me are songs that have to do with personal social interactions. I think um, Dave's not somebody who works best when he gets uh, preachy. Uh, and, you know, everybody does that from time to time. Uh, and I'm not trying to criticize his lyrics at all because uh, I think that uh, it's very hard to write good lyrics and a lot of David's songs are really great songs. So I think um, when he deals with intimate social issues like a song like Recently or a song like um, the song that Jane likes or when he deals with a personal portrait, a song like The Stone, which is just really an amazing song, uh, really engaging, really brings you in. I think that's when his lyrics work the best. Um, I think that uh, he hasn't really had a lot of pop hits because uh, there's a lot of truth in his songs. And I think that, um, you know, here I, I don't want to slap the medium or anything, but, you know, pop radio really isn't about people expressing deep thoughts. It's about, you know, uh, the flavor of the day and I think that's one reason why they haven't had a lot of top 10 hits is because that's not what their songs are about. There definitely seems to be this theme in the songs like living for the moment and living the day like the stone like you know what I mean this just sense of like why you know why not be into this moment and why not save it like love today and not you know what I mean and it just definitely seems like it's reminiscent of just his past or you know living in South Africa and you know just realizing that life is could be great and easy on a daily basis. Like, it just seems like something that most people don't want to touch on. Um, I'm trying to think, do you have any other stories that you want to share? Did you uh, remember anything you might have left out? Yeah, well, let's see. There's one time I played with the band when Stefan got hurt, and it was really pretty funny. Um, uh, because I knew all of David's songs, uh, at least his early songs, um, I got a call one day on the phone um, it was from uh, Corin, the band's manager, and uh, at that time, and uh, well, he's still their manager. And uh, he said, "Can you come down to tracks and play tonight? Stefan's hurt his hand and he can't play." Uh, and I was like, "Well, yeah, sure, <laughs> that'd be fun." So uh, I went down there, and uh, David didn't know this was happening, and he was just coming back from a trip uh, to South Africa at the time. And uh, so he came down from the airport from D.C. just in time for the gig and goes out on stage and nobody told him. So he walks out on stage, we're about to start, and I'm standing there. And he's like, what's going on? Where's Stefan? Which was, uh, it was pretty amusing. Uh, uh, there's some tapes of that floating around out there. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's really funny. I'd love to see that. Yeah, well, vid audio tapes, bad board tapes. Right. But... Um, Gosh, anything else I can think of about David? Well, I have one last, a couple questions or questions. One, could you, when did Corin enter the picture as far as the band? Corin got involved with the band uh, because he was booking tracks. And I think he was also booking the Flood Zone at that time. And uh, the band 
really needed to be playing in bigger venues. I mean, they would, they would play at Eastern Standard, they would play at Miller's, and, you know, it would be just too many people. They wanted to, to start doing something more regularly. And uh, so he started booking them at tracks and booking them at the flood zone. And then uh, he started booking them, you know, to do out-of-town shows. They played a lot of fraternity parties at colleges, uh, a lot of road trips and things like that. And it, it was a good fit. You probably won't hear this from anybody else because people don't talk about it, but there was this huge conflict between Corin and Ross Hoffman, uh, which later developed into a lawsuit. But uh, it was a struggle for the identity, really, of Dave as an artist. Um, Corin was really into the band and really saw that as the way to get things going. And Ross was really into David and really saw that, you know, didn't necessarily see the band as the best avenue for all of this music. Uh, in fact, we did a couple of shows together, just um, Dave and Carter and Tim and I uh, here in town. And it was an interesting sound, you know, it was a different kind of a sound. And so uh, kind of made a point in Ross's mind, you know, that this doesn't have to have this band in order to be a realization of the songs. So there was a struggle between Ross and Corin to kind of control how the band went. And uh, Corin won that struggle. And... Um, but I think that you can't really underestimate Ross's involvement in things early on and the importance of it. He was a big part of why things, you know, developed the way they did. Whatever happened with the demo when you went to New York? Uh, some people listened to it and they wanted more and so more demos were made. Um, it's never been released officially, although I'd love to see that happen. Um, the demo was uh, very naive in terms of how it presented the music, very simple, very pure. And you, when you listen to it, you hear David's voice in a really nascent state. I mean, it's very soft and beautiful and uh, inviting. And before he had managed to just blow it out, screaming over the monitors at countless club shows, you know. Now he's got power because he's learned how to get above that noise, you know, and they use different monitoring systems and things so he can actually hear himself sing. But I remember when I sat in with them, I couldn't believe how loud it was on the stage. Unbelievable, just how loud it was. So uh, he, he put his voice through a lot of torture in those early years, and um, uh, he's lucky it's held out, because for a lot of people, I don't think it would have. Yeah, definitely. Um, my last question is, what do you think, and I hate to ask this question, it's so cheesy, but it's the name of the show, so what do you think drives Dave? I think Dave is driven by uh, doing things he enjoys doing, uh, and I think that uh, he really enjoys working with that band. He really enjoys performing. Uh, he really enjoys uh, hanging out with his family. Uh, he really enjoys being Dave, and I think, uh, I don't say that in terms of that he's all hung up on being Dave Matthews. I think that he's just happy with who he is, and he's happy to be who he is, and uh, he's very comfortable in that. And I think that he's always found a way to let other people do what they needed to do in order to make it work, instead of standing in their way and trying to control everything. That's why the band works. That's why his relationship with Corn works. That's why everything he does works. That's why Dave works. That's great. Is there anything you want to add? No, nothing really that I can think of. Okay. Um, that sounds great. Okay.